Number one. I was part of a fundamentalist Christian cult known as ATI or IBLP. Fairly recent scandals have hit the news about the cult leader, Bill Gothard, when over 50 women came forward with allegations that he sexually harassed them. But that's only scratching the surface. Let me tell you my scariest experience. And just keep in mind, I'm far from the only one. First off, throughout my childhood, my father and sisters abused me sexually. Since the cult taught a strict familial hierarchy, with the father being the top dog, and then the mother, and then the children in order of birth, I was the youngest, and so at the bottom of the totem pole. My father would twist Bible verses to justify rape, death threats, and more. Because ATI is a homeschool cult, it was really easy to cover up the abuse from any prying eyes. My home was essentially a prison for 11 years until my father died of a massive heart attack. Fast forward two years. I'm 13, with a mother who's frantically fixated on me being a troubled child because, one, I dared to resist my father's advances and argue against the abuse I was suffering, gaining me the reputation of being rebellious. Two, I'm severely depressed because I'm a freaking rape victim, but depression is considered a sin. And three, I asked too many questions as to why we believe the things we did. Needless to say, you don't ask questions. So, she calls some cult members here and there, pulls some strings, and long story short, she gets me placed in a secretive program called the Log Cabin Program. They tell her very few details about it, and she tells me even less. All I know is I'm about to move to Oklahoma for a while to be fixed by nice counsellors because I'm a dirty sinner. Wednesday, July 11th, 2001. I'm dropped off at a lockdown compound in the middle of nowhere near Skyatook, Oklahoma, called Eagle Spring Training Center. For appearance sake, they pose as a residential childcare facility. This means my mother literally signs over custody of me, her own child, to a bunch of strangers in a compound in the middle of nowhere, and leaves me there, and goes back home, far away. They assure her I'm in good hands. For the next two years, I'm brainwashed, starved, sleep deprived, threatened with a shotgun, punished, humiliated, interrogated, and terrorized. I lost 40 pounds in the first month or two. They took me off of my medications, believing it was wrong to take them. I went cold turkey. I exhibited severe symptoms of withdrawal, and they go ignored. I am worked grueling hours, sent on aimless hikes and marches, scrubbing floors on my hands and knees until my knuckles are cracked and bleeding from the bleach, punished with hard labor until I'm near fainting. Oh, they had such fun coming up with new and strange punishments, and they used the word punishment to imply that we deserved it, when in fact they are instructed specifically to break the student's will, whatever it takes. One such punishment was a forced vow of silence. You were told to never speak for days, or maybe even weeks on end, if you do, you are punished further. I was given tasks that were designed to fail. For example, extremely short time limits on difficult tasks. This was all in order to be punished and humiliated further. I was forced to grovel and confess humiliating sins, existent or not, in front of 30 or so members in the compound. I was given spoiled, undercooked foods and even chemically treated water that burned my throat and left me horribly sick. I was placed in solitary confinement for two and a half weeks while they bled music to torture me. The song lyrics went, Trust in the Lord, he makes no mistakes, he knoweth the end of each path we take. For when I am tried and purified, I shall come forth as gold. Basically, it was a blatant message. You're being tortured because God loves you, and he's going to put you through fire to melt you 
into gold. I was screamed at and exercised for hours on end. I had no privacy. Even going to the bathroom, they would stand outside the door. I could go on and on and on. After all, I was there for two years. The scariest part of all of this is that I am far from the only one. The log cabin program was run in Oklahoma, and I believe an alternate version for Russian orphans was done elsewhere, either in Indiana or Illinois. All of these programs secretly tortured and brainwashed children and teenagers. Many of them were so-called delinquents, who were ordered by judges to be shipped to these compounds and held against their wills. This runs very deep. It's never been accounted for, and probably never will. They tried to investigate alarming allegations of child abuse in Indianapolis, and the whole thing got swept under the rug. The only thing you got to hear about on the news was Gothard feeling up a bunch of women. You never heard about his systematic child torture programs. Bill Gothard and the IBLP simply have their fundamentalist hands in too many pies. They'll probably never be caught. Number 2 I live in the southern part of California, Orange County to be specific. My dad grew up here before moving in with my mother on the East Coast, and then eventually back to the OC. When he was a young teenager, most of our neighborhood was full of orange groves. He and his friends used to explore in there and smoke weed in them. My dad told me he once had a friend whose name I can't remember, so for the sake of this story, we'll call him Jack. He was the son of a woman named Frances Marie Clug a religious cult leader who thought she'd been visited by God or Jesus or something. She claimed to be a prophet, and eventually broke away from the Catholic Church to form the Hill of Hope congregation. This woman had a lot of followers. Her son was definitely not one of them, as he would often hang out with my dad in the groves, smoking weed and talking shit about his mother and her followers. Francis, according to my dad, always had these bodyguard-type dudes around her, who, oftentimes, were armed. This made her far scarier than any elderly crazy woman should be. They'd go looking for Jack, forcing him sometimes to hide in the groves. The Hill of Hope eventually created a fort of some kind in Carbon Canyon, fitting because a bunch of creepy-as-fuck things go on there all the time. At this time, the fort, or compound, was in the process of being built. Jack and his mother had been bumping heads more often, and my dad started to notice that Jack wasn't around as often either. Eventually, he stopped making appearances altogether. Frances Clug eventually up and left with a lover of hers to another country. Some sources say that she returned and eventually died at the hill in 09. But the Hill of Hope is still there in Carbon Canyon, Still guarded, and still in use, I believe. They're very secretive, and they don't let any outsiders onto the property. My dad swears that Clug had her followers kill her son and hide his body under the cement foundations of the hill. The kid disappeared without a trace. Clug didn't seem phased, and the cement was laid down shortly afterwards. My dad says it's too much of a coincidence. He never did hear from his friend again. The original poster has included information, an article, and a link to the website of the Hill of Hope. This can all be found in the description below. Number 3 Years ago, as a 17-year-old, I worked at a deli in a grocery store. This grocery store was in a small town, so it seemed as if we had a very concentrated amount of crazy people. I was really naive, and I wasn't very good at saying no to people, so I got into a lot of perplexing situations there. For our uniforms, we had to wear white button-up blouses, black pants, black aprons, and a huge name tag. 
The name tag not only had our first names, but our last names as well. My first name is slightly unique, and my last name is uncommon. Basically, I'm really easy to find. You search my name in Google or Facebook, and I'm the only one, as of now, that pops up. I was always really uncomfortable with people seeing my full name in such a public job. An older man with big glasses, a white beard, and a red plaid coat came in one day, asking for something small. As I was dishing it up, I did my usual chatter with the customer. He was asking me a lot of really uncomfortable, personal questions, but I wasn't quite catching on that he was getting creepy. I was a senior, and I shared that with him. He asked me a few more things, and he was on his merry way. I promptly forgot about him. One week later, he came back in, and asked me if he could take a picture of me. I didn't know what to think of it, but I smiled, and I said that I belonged behind a camera, not in front of one. He nervously laughed, and then disappeared. About 15 minutes later, a co-worker ran up to me and asked me if I had just seen this old guy in a red plaid coat take a picture of me from behind a glass window we had by the entrance. It was really creepy, but I let it go. About two weeks after this, he came back in and waited until I was free to speak to him. He told me that his name was something like Emmanuel Lamb Branch. He asked me if I would like to go out to his house in the country every Thursday night and be his hostess for these readings that he had. He said he wanted a beautiful woman to greet his guests and be admired by his side. I told him, thank you, but I work two jobs, and I value the few nights I get off a week, and I would rather spend them with my family. In trying to convince me, he told me that he had a community of people that lived on his land, and they were all very peaceful. I turned him down again, and I moved on to another customer who was waiting for me. Later on that week, Emmanuel Lambranch came back in with some flyers. Apparently, he had been going door to door. He handed them to me, and then told me he was waiting for me, and then left. I read the literature on my break. One of them was a typed-out love poem. It was very sexual. The next was some political flyer. I guess he was running for president or something. The third absolutely creeped me out. I wish I still had it to type out word for word. Basically, it was informing people of the New Kingdom and how Emmanuel Lambranch was the leader of this New Kingdom and that he had a bride waiting for him. His bride was me. He put my full stinking name in there, and explained how he commissioned a local artist to paint a large portrait portraying me as his bride. Apparently, it was sitting above his fireplace. He said that we were supposed to have his descendants who would rule the new kingdom. That was it. I'd had enough of him. I went home crying, and I asked my mum what I should do. She immediately called the police and they issued a restraining order on him. They took all of the papers that he had given me, and they went to talk with him. He told them I wanted to be his bride, and was waiting until I turned 18. Well, Emmanuel Lambranch still came into the store that I worked at for the next month. He would stand over by the magazines and just watch me for hours. It made me really nervous. Finally, a co-worker alerted the manager, who told him he could never come back inside. No, he just stood outside the door. Apparently that summer, he was jailed for some violent behaviour, and I never saw him again. Number 4 My parents were members of an Islamic cult with a fake guru, holy man sort of thing. He used to lead group chants, and one time, while everyone's eyes were closed, chanting away in the semi-darkness, me and him locked eyes, 
and he realised that I was laughing at how dumb it all was. After that, he had a vendetta against me. He could apparently read the future, and he turned my parents against me, convincing them that one day in the future I would break their hearts and destroy the family. Because they were so invested in him, they started to believe it, and they treated me, a 13-year-old boy, as if I had already committed this unspeakable act. After this, he made my parents focus on my older brother more than me, lavishing him with expensive gifts such as Gucci watches, a brand new Mitsubishi Jeep with a private plate before he even passed his driver's test, and experiences like executive box seats to major sporting events up and down the country, plus more. After this, he convinced all of his followers that I was mentally handicapped and needed to be kept isolated. For most of my teenage years, I would come home from school or college or university to an empty house, many times not seeing another soul for weeks. The story of my parents' quote-unquote retarded child spread through the entire community, where it is now accepted as fact, and I can't even get married because everyone just assumes that I'm mentally disabled. After this, he bankrupted my parents and my family, making them pay all of his bills and expenses, and rewarding them with prayers. Through a too-complicated-to-go-into-now chain of events, I was given the responsibility to become a full-time parent to my two-year-old female cousin, so he convinced everybody that I was a paedophile and molesting the baby so that I couldn't be left alone with her. He convinced my parents that I was their enemy, and that his sons were their real sons, and to ignore my entire life. To this day, I have never once been able to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with either of my parents. I've been working for six years now, and they don't even know what I do. They're only interested in what day I get paid. There's been more done to me than this short amount, but I just want to say that I'm a better man than anyone has ever understood, and I forgive my parents, now that that bastard has been dragged to hell. The most disturbing thing about this cult is that there are millions of holy men like this all over the world. The second most disturbing thing is how easy they find it to gather followers who believe that they are divinely powered individuals through nothing more than cheap parlor tricks, vague prophecies, and unprovable claims. Like the time he'd visited Jupiter via spirit travel. If anybody is hearing this who is going through something similar, all I can say is that your family is ill. If they were of sound mind, they wouldn't be doing these things. Be kind, be good, be better than them. Peace. Hi guys, Lazy here, and thank you very much for listening. I think that cults are a really interesting topic actually. The way that a handful of people, or sometimes even just one individual, are able to effectively control others. Sort of like brainwashing I suppose, promising them eternal salvation or whatever in return for their complete and utter loyalty. When we all really know that the only true salvation comes from subscribing to this channel and watching all of my videos religiously. Stay spooky. And remember, the best things happen in the dark.